These words are spoken in the name and the love and the power of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Good morning. What could be better than an army of green right in front of me? Uh, Absolutely awesome. So, many of you know some of the things I'm going to say, and the first is this, that St. Mark is the Ernest Hemingway of New Testament writers. And by that I mean that St. Mark gets more done with fewer words than any other writer I have ever read. Mark's Gospel is it's brutally sparing. It really is. And so very few words, very big impact. And Mark's Gospel is blunt. Bam! Okay? And he writes bluntly and his Jesus is blunt. Jesus is constantly on the move. It says in Mark's Gospel 43 times the word immediately. And Jesus is a man on the move delivering, delivering, delivering God. Right? So let's actually slow Jesus down here a little bit and enter into this great story of the stilling of the storm. And it begins, when evening had come. So before this, the day that Jesus had was a long day. And in fact, in Mark's Gospel, we hear over and over that Jesus has long days, right? We know that he gets up before dawn to go pray. We know that he spends his days teaching and preaching. We know that he spends his days healing and helping people. And that his charism, his charism from God, attracts large crowds of people who sometimes pursue him. And he says, says, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. This all begins all very innocently, right? Let us go over to the other side. And perhaps in that, unadorned as it is, perhaps there is a certain fatigue, a a kind of, I'm done here, I need a breakness. Uh, And then listen to the phrasing of the next little bit here. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. Other boats were with him. Now, I love that little piece. So, Jesus doesn't own a boat, right? He grew up 25 miles away in landlocked Nazareth in a little hamlet on a hillside. And uh, after his coming to him, the fullness of his self, his knowledge of his relationship with God, he moves from Nazareth to the, sh- the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee to a town called Capernaum, which is the hometown of, of Peter and Andrew and James and John, the sons of Deb- Zebedee. This is a fishing village. And so they take Jesus with them in their boats. He's the passenger. And it says that other boats are with him. And then there's this little phrase. You know, the the Scriptures are filled with the gems and the little phrases. And it says that he went just as he was. Just as he was. So without giving any specifics, this little phrase tells us so much about Jesus, right? So he didn't say, hey, I've got to go back and grab my bag. I've got some things I want to bring. And then, that's who Jesus was, right? So Jesus was who he was. He wasn't many things. He was just Jesus. He was always himself. He, he had complete authenticity. All of the research in our world shows what do people want out of, what does the non-religious world want out of religious people? They want authenticity. That's the number one thing. Show me the goods. Show me the goods. And Jesus was all of that. And the very purpose of Scripture is to show us who Jesus was. Right? That's the purpose of the Gospel. And it says that a great windstorm arose. And I know that many of you have been to the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is not a sea. It's a large lake. It's 16 miles long and a mile or two at the widest portion of it. And winds arise on the Sea of Galilee all the time. In fact, those of you who are on the second pilgrimage, we go out on the Sea of Galilee in our Holy Land pilgrimages. And on the second one, we were in this, this junket and a wind rose, arose while we were out there. So you, you start off and it's, 
it's placid and peaceful and suddenly there's, there's, there's a sort of push on the wind and there's waves in the water. And the, this happens all the time because the Transjordan Mountains, where Jordan is, the desert, comes down and it rolls, the winds roll down into the Jordan Valley and the Sea of Galilee is the top of the Jordan Valley and it hits that water and that warmth and it causes these winds and the wind arose. Now it says here, again, so sparingly that the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. Uh, sort of bizarrely and luckily and coolly, not a word, enough. Uh, about 40 years ago, some Palestinian fishermen discovered a boat from Jesus' time. It was buried under the water and there was a great drought and as the sea moved back, they accidentally stumbled on, upon this boat, which is now uh, kept in a kibbutz near the Sea of Galilee. So you can go see the boat. Perhaps it's as wide as this pew, or maybe a little bit longer than the pew. And it's a fishing boat. And the sides of the boat, the gunnels are low down so that they can haul the nets in. So it's not hard to see if one of these boats has eight men in it, and the, sea is, the seas have gotten rough that the water would already be coming into the boat. Now, layered into this, what we might miss is the Hebrew people's great fear of the water, a great, great fear of open water, because it represents for them the power of chaos. And in the Bible, the power of chaos, uh, in the, from the Hebrew perspective, is greatly feared. Okay, so it is, in some sense, such a fear that that's how the Bible begins. The first thing that the Bible addresses is chaos, and the chaos of water. You ready? In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. So that's how the story begins. God creates heaven and earth, and the earth is deep sea. It's the, it's the it's the, it's the place of chaos, and the six days of creation are actually God bringing order out of chaos. That's actually what's happening in the six days of creation, and of course, the rest on the seventh. Now, just pausing here for a second, I mean, it is beyond obvious to say that the world we live in today is marked by a type of chaos, right? And it's also beyond obvious to say that so many of us experience incredible internal chaos and uh, interior storms where we, we feel we're going to go under, right? And, and so much of the reaction to all that, of course, is the way we self-medicate as a culture to try to, to, try to calm the waters, right? To, the, the chaos is frightening. We're, we're afraid we're going to perish. Now, it says in the Scripture but he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. So, biblical scholars love that little, that little half a sentence. And they love it because biblical scholars are often looking for sort of the authentic Jesus, right? What is a story that's authentically, authentically of Jesus? And they love this because it points out that Jesus was in the back of the boat, he was asleep, and he was on a cushion. This cushion thing plays, you know, sort of oddly big in biblical scholarship as a genuine story. So maybe you might just take a moment and imagine yourself as Jesus, right? So what does the asleep on the cushion mean? Does it mean he's exhausted? He's likely exhausted. Or, and, does it also mean that his trust in God is so profound that even in the storm... He's snoozing away, right? Now, again, layered into this that we might miss, but if you're devoted to reading the Psalms, you know this in particular, when the Hebrew people feel forsaken, like, like they're going to be crushed, they often understand that as God is asleep. So we have Jesus asleep in the back of the boat. And it says, And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Okay. So, uh, about 25 years ago, Jennifer's cousin, Lucy, got in a boat and she said, 
you know, quite innocently, let's go, let's go out in the boat. And we headed out from a mooring and through a channel and up into a marsh, and all was peace. And while we were tootling around the marsh, a great wind arose. An ocean wind came, and it combined with a, an incoming tide, and it turned this channel that we had driven through peacefully into a wave machine. It was the only way home for us, and before we actually quite understood it, we worked our way into the channel before we began to understand that this was incredibly dangerous. I mean, it was, it was sort of up the wave and down into the valley and, and then up into the wave and plunging into the trough, and, and it got more and more pronounced as we went. And this was a new used boat with an old <laughs> Evinrude engine on it. I can still see the engine. And as the rhythm became deeper, I started to feel like this was like my kids in the bathtub, right? That little plastic boat just wasn't going to make it, and we were all going in the water. And we had a two-year-old and a four-year-old sitting peacefully in the stern, having no idea that they were about to die. And they, didn't, they weren't sitting on a cushion. They were sitting on a cushion, but they had those life jackets where it looks like their head is going to pop off. And I had one eye on the wave and one eye on my kids, and I was petrified. And Jennifer was stoic, and Lucy pretended like nothing was wrong. We just all pretended. But nobody breathed, except for the two kids in the back who were essentially asleep on the cushions. Right? They didn't know any better. And I was thinking, oh, how am I going to save them? We're all going to die on this on this, what started off as a peaceful voyage. It's completely petrifying. Maybe you have one of those stories too. I mean, the men in this boat are going to die. They're going to die. It says that Jesus woke up and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. So this is the Word of God through whom all things were created, the Word made flesh, and Jesus, who a little bit earlier had been rebuking the demons, He rebukes the wind and He rebukes the water, right? Boom! Now, He's caring for His kids, right? He's caring for His flock. He's making it safe for them in a way that certainly I wasn't capable of that. And it says the, the wind ceased and there was dead calm. I can only say that when we, you know, excruciatingly and exhaustingly made it through the channel and took a left out of the channel, I, I have no words for the peace that comes when you realize you're not going to die. And that must be what these men felt. They're, they're, they're not going to die. But also, when you take like this crazy storm and suddenly it's like, soupy still, it must have been eerie in the night, right? Remember that the creation starts at nighttime. It's nighttime. Parenthetically, I think that this is a lot of our drug epidemic in our world today. People can't stand the storm. They can't take the storm. They can't take their boats they just can't take it anymore. That's how, that's how it happens. They just want calm. They just want stillness. So Jesus, he said to them, why are you so afraid and have you still no faith? Now, I just have to tell you, I didn't do that justice. Okay? This is not like me saying to my kids who come, used to come to me with night terrors, am I saying, it's okay. That's not what's happening here. Jesus is rebuking his friends. Boom! Boom! The same power he rebuked the winds, the same power he rebuked the demons when he was on land, he is rebuking his friends. And it's not that he's mad at them, he's trying to wake them up. This is a, this is a wake up kind of moment here. I mean, there's a great irony here, right? Jesus is asleep in the back 
but completely spiritually awake. Those guys are totally awake and completely spiritually asleep. And he says this word here, right? Have you still no faith? There's a lot in that little word, still. Now, the, the faith that Jesus is talking about isn't like, uh, this is an intellectual assent. I believe in God who I cannot see. That's not what, what he's talking about here, right? When Jesus is talking about faith, he's talking about spiritual knowledge, and he's talking about active participation in the Spirit of God, the sort of Spirit of Christ. And he sees his disciples as bereft, and he is perhaps frustrated with them because what has he been doing? He just spent the whole day teaching them. That's what's the beginning of the gospel. That's the first 35 verses is Jesus, Jesus' is dharma, his teachings about the way of God. And it seems like they got none of it, right? And, and how, do the, how are they? the disciples in Mark's Gospel, they always seem to get none of it, right? They're, they're dull dullards. They don't get it. And then it says that, you know, oh, let me pause for a second. So how about if Jesus were here today? I think I'd be petrified, right? It would be very confusing. And, and I just have to say, would he still not say to us the same thing? When you look at the chaos of your life, do you still have no faith, right? And then it says, they were filled with a great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So this is, you know, this is kind of like a biblical a duh, right? So who is this? Well, it's is it, you know, they don't seem to kind of get it, right? And it's kind of a rhetorical question, like, well, he's the Son of God. So this, this story, the story of the stealing of the storm, sometimes gets put in the category of miracle stories, right? That's, that's how biblical criticism puts this. And I think it actually isn't a great place to put it, because this isn't ultimately meant to be a miracle story. This is meant to be a manifestation story. And, and this is a story to tell us who Jesus was, or just as he was, to quote what was earlier in the gospel. This is a story to tell us Jesus just as he was, and it was to tell us just as he was spiritually. In other words, he is and was fully awake in God and had these powers. This is, this is a story about the insides of Jesus. This is a sacramental story, right? The stilling of the storm is an outward and visible manifestation of Jesus' inward spiritual reality. So the story ends with a question mark. This, what they call a pericope, this passage ends with a question mark. And anytime you're reading the Bible and it ends in a question mark, it's a this. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. And in this, there's several challenges. I mean, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? In other words, for us, the question is this. You have to look in your own heart for this. What is it that you don't believe about Jesus, about the power of Jesus? What is it, what is it that you, you're doubting? You're, you're, not, you're just kind of not with the program. You're not... Um, given your energy, participating in his power. And the second question is, of course, why are you so afraid? Why are we so afraid? Hey, look at the world, right? There's incredible geopolitical fear in the world today. Why are you so afraid? And the third thing, the third question that just hangs out there at the end is, are you still without faith? In other words, even after you have stepped out, I mean, I have to say, I'm, <laughs> I'm seriously grateful that you all came to church today. Really. I'm really grateful. You all, you all stepped out to do that. 
But Jesus, if he was standing here, he might say to us, that still thing, right? Are you still without faith? There is a power in Jesus, and the gospel is trying to tell us about the Jesus power. And the story is saying to us, plug into it, get on board.